So tonight we're very fortunate. Um, <clears throat> throughout the semester we'll have um, different people coming by talking about different things. But um, very fortunate to um, have with us tonight author of this book. <coughs> His name is Fred Goodman. You're all obviously very familiar with it based upon your questions. Uh, Fortune's Fool. It's an uh, account of uh, some recent trials and tribulations of Edgar Brofman. And uh, we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts of that. But first, I'd like to introduce the author, Fred, and ask him if he would mind taking a seat. Uh, Thanks. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> this is not Fred's first book. Um, some of you might be familiar with this title also, uh, Mansion on the Hill. Um, also another very good read with a lot of uh, fun stories and episodes in here. But I thought we'd get to know a little bit about Fred before we got into the nuts and bolts of the book. So I, I think it's always interesting for people to know how you got started, you know, how you got to write a book. Um, not specifically this book, but anyway. Fred, yeah, well, <laughs> how does Fred Goodman from White Plains, New York? Bronx, New York. Bronx, New York. Okay. How, how does Fred get to um, <coughs> become a, a writer, author who has... has become Fred Goodman from White Plains. Right. There you go. Okay. Um, well, I um, came to New York and wanted to be a writer um, and got a job uh, working in a warehouse, in a record warehouse on 11th Avenue, what they used to call a one-stop, which is, you know, if you were a small independent record store, right, and you wanted a chain, you weren't big enough to get a direct account from the record company. They only sold direct to like Tower Records or Sam Goody or a big chain or something like that. Uh, your grandparents might have told you about Crazy Eddie's, you know, something like that. But if you were a small store, you had to buy from an independent wholesaler called One Stops. And that was a place that had basically every record in the world, supposedly. And I worked at one on 11th Avenue. Before that, I had worked in record stores in upstate New York where I went to school. So I, I was down here doing that, and uh, I started writing for uh, the Aquarian. That was the first place I wrote over here in New Jersey, one of the first places I wrote. And, uh, I was interested in jazz music. I wrote about jazz music. I used to do things like interview Sun Ra for the Aquarian, if anybody knows who these guys are, um, corrupting the minds of young America. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was good. And uh, from that, I got a job working. There was a, a business publication, what they used to call a trade magazine. You, you all know Billboard. But back when I moved to New York, there were three weekly trade magazines in New York for the music business, Billboard, Record World, and Cashbox. And uh, I worked at Cashbox, uh, and I got a job first writing jazz column and then covering retail, and you know started to do more and more, and uh, then moved to Billboard. And from Billboard, got hired to work at Rolling Stone. So, you know, it's kind of this is it. You know, you take the little job and then you get a little bit bigger job and a little bit bigger job. You know, until I got to Rolling Stone, where everybody started at Rolling Stone because their dad was like the governor of Ohio or something. Um, but my dad was an engineer from Washington Heights, so I had to start low. <clears throat> Anyhow, that was what I did. I went to Rolling Stone. I was there for a couple of years, and then I went out as a freelancer and started writing books. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Uh, I'm basically someone who was always interested in the business of music. You know, I mean, I love music. I was originally sort of a jazz critic, which is a tough, tough, tough way to make a living. And... Um, because I, I found the business part of it just as fascinating as the music. I mean, you know, I kind of joked that, like, at Cashbox, we used to see everybody. You know, it was, it was a great thing. Anybody who had a record out, they wanted to come by Cashbox, we would take them, you know. And they would let them come up, and they would sit and talk. And everybody from Ronnie Spector to B.B. King to Steve Van Zandt to Allen Ginsberg, because he made a recording with The Clash. You know, would come by and it was it was great. Now, and in all fairness, Cashbox was probably the third. It was the smallest of the three, and <coughs> and and uh, it was run by a crazed old dictatorial guy who was awful. Marty. No, that it was George Albert. Oh, George, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, anyhow, it, it was a horrendous, horrendous human being. Right. And um, <coughs> before but, before Warren, this is videotape. But he's dead. Um, <laughs> This is suffice to say, um, because everybody comes up and it's an understaffed place, you learn a lot. 
So that was a good, good, you know, first serious job. Uh, and then, like I said, going on Cashbox, Billboard, Rolling Stone. Um, and, and Rolling Stone, it was interesting because my background was essentially being a business reporter about music. That was kind of what they hired me for at Rolling Stone. They said, well, you know, uh, we need somebody who really knows more about the business. You know, Jan Wenner, the publisher of Rolling Stone, he's got a lot of friends in the record business. He wants them to know he knows what's going on. So, you know, you come and beef up the magazine a little bit on that. And that was really kind of my beat, and I've always enjoyed it. But as I say, when everybody came up at Cashbox, I used to make a joke. You know, you interview like all these guys, you know, and they're nice guys, and some of them aren't so nice. Some of them are smart, and some of them aren't so smart, you know. But after a while, you start to feel like usually the most interesting person in the room is the quiet guy in the back, the manager, you know. And so after a while, you start getting drawn to these guys because their stories are a little bit different, and they're frequently the ones that have something different to say. You know, sometimes the artists are great, and sometimes they're not. But, you know, the guy with the plan is frequently, you know, the manager. And when I did my first book, The Mansion on the Hill, that was largely about how does rock and roll, this thing that's not about business, you know, how does it start with, like, hippies smoking dope in places like San Francisco and Boston? And how do you wind up with multinational corporations like Sony and Time Warner and what was a big global music business, you know? How does it go from being not about business to being about business? So a lot of it was following the development of business practices and of the managers who kind of invented the business because these guys were very key in putting the artists in control of their careers. You know, people talk about Brian Epstein of the Beatles and he had, you know, the greatest act in the world, but he was not a very sophisticated or far-thinking manager. The Beatles deals weren't very good, they were getting half a penny a record. You know, it's other guys. To me, one of the big guys was Albert Grossman, who managed Bob Dylan. He invented and created Peter, Paul, and Mary. You know, his idea was there was a folk boom going on. He owned a folk club in Chicago called the Gate of Horn. And he had lots of folk artists coming through, some of whom he became the manager for, like Bob Gibson and Odetta and some of these people. And then he started thinking, well, how can we do something bigger? And he went to Peter Yarrow, who was a folk singer of some note in New York, and said, look, I have an idea. I want to put you in a group with another guy who's, you know, be kind of an entertainer, maybe a comedian type, and a really good-looking girl singer. And, you know, we'll package the three of you, and none of this will in any way detract from you as a serious performer. All it will do will allow more people to hear you. And thus was made Peter, Paul, and Mary. And it was a huge success. Uh, and he used that, you know, when he, the success of that attracted Bob Dylan to Albert Grossman. He became Dylan's manager. He used Peter, Paul, and Mary to get Dylan into a bigger artist by having them cover Dylan songs, right? And blowing in the wind, you know, becomes a hit. And suddenly Bob Dylan is a bankable commodity and, and Albert Grossman is a bankable commodity. And he starts attracting all these other artists like the Butterfield Blues Band, Janis Joplin, the band, and in fact it gets to the point where they're so insular and so almost like too hip, you know, that some of his artists like the band never really have the commercial success that you might expect them to. I mean, they were hugely influential among other artists, you know. I mean, to this day you can't read interviews with, you know, any sort of Americana or Roots act, even British ones, you know, Richard Thompson talks about you know, hearing Big Pink, you know, and what it meant to Fairport Convention or Los Lobos or any of the, you know, serious Americana artists, you know, this is like a real watershed American act, the band. And yet they never had, you know, with the exception of uh, up on Cripple Creek, they never really had any kind of radio play. You know, and that was usually the news that a manager would bring, like, hey, if you guys would make one single, you'd sell ten times as many albums. But they got too hip for that, you know. So there was even a sense where it gets too insular. But these are the guys who invent it. They empower the artists. You know, before Albert Grossman, you know, the record company tells you, here's your producer, here's the songs you're going to do, here's the art direction, here's the day it's going to be done. And after Albert Grossman, it's like, fuck you. We're the artist. We'll hire the art director if we don't like your art director. We'll hire the producer if we don't like your producer. And we'll make the record wherever the hell we want to make it. We're not coming to your studio. 
you know, and a rep is done when we say it is, you know, thank you. Take, you know, take that schedule and forget about it. And, and this is sort of the beginning, you know, and, and this is the way it goes. And, and you start to see this around 1966, 67. And, and, and that's really sort of the beginning of, you know, when the artists take control. And, and of course, there is, you know, the other side of it, which is, you know, the attorneys start to get involved and they say, oh, Albert Grossman called them artists and they did concerts, you know. Once he started calling them artists, the fees went way up, you know. So there's a lot of empowering the artists. And that was the thing that started to interest me about the record business. Who are these guys that also make it possible? Because, you know, you can look at, you know, at, at Bob Dylan and say, okay, you know, here's a great artist. Where, and, and, and that was the thing that sort of struck me is, you know, you can look at, at a career and you can say, okay, where there's a lot of great recordings, there's a great artist. But usually where there's a great career, there's a great manager. You know, like the perfect example, and it became a very key part of this book, Mansion on the Hill, is Bruce Springsteen's career. Because here's a guy who's made consistently good records, but he's had a great career. And the person who's responsible for the great career is not Bruce Springsteen, it's his manager. You know, so I wrote a lot in that book about, well, what did John Landau, Bruce Springsteen's manager, do to create Bruce Springsteen, you know, and to make him such a big star? And is it what you think it is or is it something else? So those were kind of the issues that I got involved with. Uh, and it became sort of a book about the invention of the, what was then the global record industry. Now, when I came time to do my latest book, obviously things have changed a lot. Um, you know, the question is, what happened to the record business after Napster? And how would you write about it? That was really the thing that interested me in, 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 in this book. And I thought, well, there were really only two people in the music business at the moment that would be a good vehicle for writing about these changes. One is Steve Jobs, who runs Apple, and he doesn't generally make himself available to the press. Uh, and the other one that interested me was Edgar Bronfman, who had just bought the Warner Music Group. Now, Edgar Bronfman, if you've looked at the book, you, you'll know some of this, had gone through a very humiliating business disaster just two years before. He was born very wealthy. He's a billionaire. He was born into the family that ran Seagram's, the liquor empire. He was born into it. He was given control of the company. And he was not interested in the liquor business. He was interested in the entertainment business. So he began making Seagram over from a liquor company into an entertainment company, first by buying MCA, and then by buying Interscope, and later by buying Polygram Records, so that he had made this enormous entertainment company. Uh, and he did it all just before Napster. Can you, can you share why he was interested in the entertainment industry as opposed to the liquor business? Well, he had always been interested in, in the entertainment industry ever since he was a kid. He was not a guy, never even went to school, didn't go to college, you know, was not interested in school, uh, but is a hardworking guy, you know. Um, and his dad, who had run, the Seagram was started by the, his grandfather, who was this dictatorial figure, Sam Bronfman, you know, they were involved in bootlegging and all kinds of stuff. They made their fortune really during Prohibition. They were a Canadian liquor company who had the good fortune to have all their American competitors go out of business. <laughs> so if you wanted liquor, you had to come to the Bronfmans, basically. And although there were all these stories about them bootlegging, they said they never did it. In the 60s, they signed um, a tax settlement with the Canadian government that was tantamount to admitting to having sold 55% of all alcohol consumed in the United States during Prohibition. So they made a lot of money. And of course, once Prohibition ended, they still had all this liquor, they still had all this cash, and what they did was they just overwhelmed the American market. They made even more money after Prohibition ended because they were very clever. During Prohibition, they sold the worst crap they had to Americans, right? Because they said, well, it's all I can get, right? So let's sell the cheap stuff. And when Prohibition ended, they were sitting on millions of gallons of prime liquor. So everybody wants good liquor. Where do they have to go? They have to go to the same place they'll be getting their crap, the Bronfman's. So Seagram goes on to become, you know, an enormous company. I mean, it was, it was a thing. One out of every three drinks in the world was sold by Seagram at that point. 
So it's this huge, huge company. So then it becomes a thing. Okay, can anybody equal what Grandpa did? You know, first the son tries to do it, Edgar Sr. And he has some good successes. I mean, through a weird sort of permutation that I won't get into, he wound up buying 25% of DuPont, which was like printing money. You know, I mean, DuPont owns tremendous patents and rights and, and is an enormous, enormous chemical uh, company. And this was like considered one of the all-time great rock bottom assets that you could ever get your mitts on. And they got, through this weird stock manipulation, they got 25% of DuPont. And that became a big driving force of the Seagrams and threw up cash and, you know, it helped Seagram. In fact, people like to buy Seagram stock as a backdoor to owning DuPont. That's how big a part it was of Seagram. So, anyhow, he, Edgar Sr. had also wanted to be in the film business. And his father, Mr. Sam, the old Seagram guy, didn't want to have anything to do with that, would never allow him to be in it. So, in some sense, when Edgar Jr. comes along and he wants to be in the film business and he wants to be in entertainment, his father is very encouraging because his dad wouldn't let him do it. You know, he, he wanted to own MGM. His father, you know, famously said, oh, he spent $40 million on MGM stock and his father dismissively says, oh, does it really cost $40 million to get laid? You know, and his son goes, no, dad, it doesn't cost $40 million to get laid. It costs a lot less, you know, that kind of thing. But there was a lot of acrimony about what they were going to do with this money and he didn't like it. So the father is willing to let Edgar Jr. do all these things and, and follow his sort of dream. So he's encouraged to go and do this and make Seagram over in his own image. But it sets up this big dichotomy in the family because there are other Bronfmans who don't want this to happen. So it's a big fight. Should we continue in the liquor business? Should we go in the entertainment business? And eventually, you know, they go more towards the entertainment business uh, because Edgar and his father can, can move it in that way. Um, and eventually, they make a deal. What happens is, not only does Napster come along, but I don't know if you remember the AOL Tom Warner merger around 2000. What had happened was, when the internet bubble was going on, everybody starts thinking old media is completely over, or the way to have it is that old media should be driven by new media. So what could be more natural than AOL and Time Warner to become partners? Time Warner, of course, also owns HBO, ESP, I'm sorry, ESPN is Disney, HBO, uh, Time Incorporated, uh, all their magazines, it's, and the Turner companies, Turner Broadcasting, <laughs> was this huge media company, and Warner Music was in there too, uh, which included Interscope Records, and Atlantic Records, and Electra Records, and all, all of these companies. Uh, and AOL becomes a partner, and Bronfman is running this company that owns MCA and Polygram, it's called Universal at this point, and he's afraid that if he doesn't get a big partner like this, he can't compete. And he, of course, also wants to sell out and get rid of his dad and his uncle, and he's had enough of all this family politics. So they make a deal to tie up with a French company called Vivendi, and they make a lot of money for the Bronfmans off the bat. You know, they get like $70 a share for Seagram, but in the Bronfman tradition, they don't want cash. It's got to be a straight stock swap so that they don't have to pay taxes. Well, this isn't such a great idea because the $70 or $76 a price stock share is within 18 months, $8. Family lost at least $3 billion, the Bronfman family. Stockholders, it goes down along with AOL Time Warner as one of the worst deals of, any, of our lifetime. You know, a terrible merger. It made no sense for, for some complicated reasons that I won't bother with. But anyhow, Bronfman who has been decried all the time, all these moves he wants to make where he's taking Seagram out of the liquor business and into the entertainment business, now it looks like a terrible idea. Because they're out of the liquor business, they're in the entertainment business, and their stock's at $8. And it's like, you got nothing. So, in fact, the New York Times, you know, called him Wall Street's whipping boy. Wall Street's favorite whipping boy. And, and I, at one point in the book, said, you know, He's got the worst reputation you could have as a businessman not sent to prison. You know, you have to be sent to prison to have a worse reputation as a businessman than Edgar Bronfman. So I went to him because I felt, well, this guy just bought Warner Music Group because he wants to prove that he was on the right road and just made a bad deal with Vivendi. He still believes in entertainment. He's going to be really motivated to deal with all the problems that are facing the music business. How do we get back our business after Napster? So I went to him and said, okay, I would like to follow you around and write about what you're doing. 
and talk about what's going on in the business, and he agreed to. So that was the genesis of this book. But it was that I was interested in the problems that Gabrompen faced, but only insofar as it was a good road to talk about, you know, okay, is there a next act in the record business? What are they doing? So that's the background. Thank you. Can I leave? <clears throat> no, no. But um, what about his uh, aspiring career? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, one of the things that always struck me, and having I had the opportunity to meet him and work with him, and he approached Doug Morris when Doug was unceremoniously booted out of Time Warner. He said, let's start this small label, Rising Tide, which is a reference to the movie Shawshank Redemption. And um, one of the things he wanted to do was he was uh, friends with um, another songwriter, um, Bruce, Bruce Roberts. Bruce Roberts. And, he, and Edgar was an aspiring songwriter. So he and Bruce... Well, well you, you know, Edgar, Edgar has had a career as both a film and theater producer and as a songwriter. And he's not to my taste as a songwriter. Uh, you know, his stuff has been covered by Dionne Warwick and... D uh, Donna Summer. Donna Summer and uh, what's her name, the Canadian? <laughs> Celine Dion, thank you. Um, that's the kind of stuff he writes. You know, um, very... You what's the name? So Sam, under the name Sam... Well, he's got two, two names, you know. Uh, w one is a play on his mother-in-law's name, and, and the other is, is Miles... Um, Junior Miles. His middle name is Miles. He's Edgar Bronfman Jr. So Junior Miles is one of the songwriting names. Uh, but he writes treacle, you know. I mean, it's just, it's just sort of adolescent crap. Uh, but it's very interesting because his persona as a songwriter is totally different from his persona as a businessman. I mean, if you meet this guy as a businessman, he's serious. You know, he's, he's not... You couldn't think that the guy who wrote those songs and the guy you're sitting in the meeting with are the same guy. It's really kind of fascinating that this guy has got so many different points to him. But yes, he does have this personal thing. He was a failed film director, he film producer. He made uh, The Border with uh, Jack, Jack Nicholson. Nicholson. Uh, and uh, he also, he, he managed to get a film made when he was 17, you know, because he got his dad to put up some money and he was interested in being an assistant on it and that kind of thing. And, you know, he had some other things. I mean, he was involved with David Mamet plays, and, you know, he tried seriously to, to do things on Broadway and, and uh, in the movies. And then his son sort of carries on the tradition, if I'm not mistaken, Ben. Yes. He had a punk band. Yeah. Well, he had a couple of different bands, and then he had a website. And well, and he's got a label, Owl Records. Uh, oh, that's his label. That's his label. And, and, but there's an interesting backstory that I won't tell on tape about that, but ask me later. Um, then, and um, he's also, you know, the father-in-law now of Mia, M-I-A. All right. He's married to Ben Bronfman. So, uh, that so, was so Edgar's father-in-law of Mia. Okay, that's pretty right. interesting. So, all right. So, <coughs> let me ask you a question. The title of the book. Mm. Now, <coughs> how did that, okay, they gave you unlimited access, right. and you're shadowing him around, and... And all of a sudden, the book pops up, the final copy. And I mean, how does he find out the title of the book? And then what's the response? I, I tell him. You told him? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, look, you, you know, when you're dealing with people, I don't know if anybody here is interested in journalism, you know, but, you know, when you're dealing with people, it's always best to let them hear it from you, you know, the worst. You know, and what I did mention on the Hill, you know, a lot of the book is about this guy, John Landau, a lot of the book is about David Geffen. I sent them both galleys of the book. You know, I wanted them to hear from me what was in the book. You know, it was the same with this. Uh, I picked the title, you know, because I felt that Bronfman's reputation was somewhat that he was a fool with a fortune. That sort of the denigration of him and the way he's viewed most cynically. I don't think so. I think that he's more like a Shakespearean fool. Uh, in, in that, you know, he's a guy who's there from his heart. He just happens to be there at the wrong time. You know, I mean, he fell in love with an industry that if he'd fallen in love with it 20 years ago, all his dreams would have come true. You know, he just comes along and buys into the industry, you know, three years before Sean Fanning blows it up. So, 
it was more that he was sort of a fool of fortune, you know, his fortune's fool, he'd been treated cruelly by the gods. That was the pun on the reputation. What, what does he think of the title? He hates it. Yeah, it's okay. So you talked about how um, you felt Edgar and Warner Music Group were kind of indicative or representative of what was going on now, and you'd have access. How, how, how did you go about, I mean, what was the process? I mean, you pick up the phone and say, I want to speak with Edgar Brofman? You know, I sent him a letter, you know, and, and, and you know, your calling card is your work. So, you know, you put in other books that you've written and articles and things like that, and you send it along with a note, you know, trying to convey the fact that you're serious. And, and it's interesting because at the time I approached him, he had also been approached by a Canadian film company that was making a documentary about him and about the Vivendi Universal stuff, and he didn't talk to them, you know, didn't want to have anything to do with them. But, you know, he met with me twice, you know, and we sat and talked, and he listened to me, and I told him, you know, what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, and, you know, promised him that, you know, he would not be surprised when the book came out, you know, that I would not sandbag him, you know. I said, I'm not going to pull my punches, but you'll know they're coming, you know. Uh, and he basically said, okay, and we agreed that we would get together on a regular basis and sit and talk, and we did. You know, he never canceled on me. And by the way, it never became personal. I never met with him anywhere but his office. You know, I never met with him in a restaurant or at his home. It was always a straight, you know, sort of business transaction hmm. in very, you know, prescribed sort of settings. Uh, other people did other things. When I met Lior Cohen, the first thing he did was invite me to his house for breakfast. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, people have different styles and they do it different ways. Um, and then I went out and introduced myself to some of his executives. And interestingly, Edgar was not going to put his imprimatur on this. Below the level of very senior executives, no one wanted to talk to me. All right? If they were the president of a label, they would talk to me. If they were the chairman of a label, they would talk to me. If they were the senior vice president, they would not talk to me. They didn't want to criticize anybody higher up than them. Right? So, I'm going, gee, I'm having a hard time getting these guys to talk to me. And they're just like, yeah, what can I tell you? you know, was not going to say, talk to this guy. You know, if they want to talk, they talk. If they don't want to talk, they don't talk. So, that's it. You're kind of left on your own below a certain level. That was the situation. That was the way it went. And by the way, I, I enjoyed talking to him. And I liked him very much. I mean, I'm not sure I know him. You know, I mean, there's some sense at which it was not personal, but I found the guy likable and earnest. In the, in the book, you refer to him as the idiot, the fool, and the spoiled rich kid. Well, that's talking about his reputation in the public. I mean, that's the way he's perceived. So, so what do you really think of him? I think he's serious and earnest and hardworking, and you know that was one of the things when he said he said to me, I think somewhat disingenuously, "Why would anybody be interested in a book about me?" Because I think everybody thinks they're interesting. Uh, and I said, "Well, you know, 95% of the people in the world don't like working for a living. I mean, if they had a chance to not work tomorrow, they would probably not work tomorrow." I said, "You know, you're a billionaire. You know, you go to work every day." I think people have a hard time figuring out why, and it's an interesting question. Why does this guy go to work every day? Um, and he is very motivated, you know, and, and he has something to prove. And I think the personal thing he has to prove is, you know, that he's a worthy successor to the guy who made Seagram. You know, that's sort of the family proving. You know, he hasn't proven it, but the Warner deal that he made was a very good deal, that he made money, and it did rehabilitate his reputation to a certain extent. So, you know, I think the Warner Music deal proved that he was not a fool. You know, certainly you could look at what happened at EMI, where it turned into a disaster, and see the difference. I mean, look, here's the anatomy of this Warner Music deal. We talked about the AOL Time Warner merger from 2000, right, and what a disaster that was. Well, five years later, they're trying to pick up the pieces over at Time Warner. And they're selling things to try and get money back and reduce this ridiculous debt they picked up on AOL, $20 billion. I mean, it's a crazy figure. 
and they're selling this and they're selling that. And Edgar and his partners come along and they make a deal to buy the Warner Music Group. And that is the record companies. Warner Records, Atlanta Rec Atlantic Records, Electra Records, in, uh, and none such. Interscope had already been sold off. They pay $2.4 billion to buy this record company. And it includes a very large music publishing company as well which is continuing to make money at a time when the record industry is doing badly. $2.4 billion. Here's how it's done. Edgar and three equity partners that are companies that take money and invest it in companies for an ownership stake, okay? And those companies generally stick around three, four, five years and then they want to get out. They want their money back. And what they did was they put up half of the $2.4 billion out of their own pockets. $1.2 billion. The rest they borrow from banks right off the bat. So they're in for 50%, right? Then they go out as soon as they get the company and they have what's called a bond roadshow. They go around to bond underwriters around the country and they say, we want to sell, we want, we want to borrow money as bonds $600 million. Here's our business, here's the books, here's what we want, blah, blah, blah. They do it, it's a huge success, they get $600 million in bonds. Where does that money go? That money goes right back into the pockets of the investors. They have now paid themselves back half of their $1.2 billion. Their exposure in the $2.4 billion, billion dollar purchase of Warner Music is now $600 million. That's a month after buying the company. Ten months later, they go public. They go to Wall Street. They say, we want to take the company public. We're going to offer a 25% share of Warner Brothers. We want $750 million for our 25% share in this company. That's what we'd like to stock the flood at. And they basically get it. So what happens? A year after... They put up $1.2 billion, they got back $600 million a month later, 11 months later, here's $750 million. We got all our money back and we made $150 million. Not bad. They now own the company free and clear. All they gave up was a 25% ownership stake to the public, right? So, it was a good deal. EMI, which happened three or four years later, and was done by uh, an English banker named Guy Hands, turned out to be a disaster. Warner very much wanted to buy EMI. When they saw the price that Guy Hands paid, they were like, <laughs> we're out. They couldn't value the company anywhere near what Guy Hands was paying. I have to believe that a lot of this had something to do with Edgar Bronfman having a bad reputation. That Guy Hands, who had been a pretty smart money manager up until that point in England, came along, looked at the record business and thought, if that moron, Edgar Bronfman, can make money, anybody can do it. Except that he's not a moron and it's not that easy. There is such a thing as a good deal and a bad deal. You have to know what something's worth. And in this case, Bronfman and his partners knew, and Guy Hands and Citibank did not know. And, you know, that was the difference there. So... <clears throat> what is your analysis of how he's doing now, Edgar? Because now they, Brian Goldman Sachs, asked them to come in and say, <clears throat> we're not sure what we want to do here. Maybe we want to cash out and sell the company. Because I guess one of the investment partners, Thomas H. Lee, is sort of like, okay, we've had enough. Mm -hmm. We want to get out. Well, they've been in a long time. Right. I mean, for, for, for these investors, you know, they, these companies like Thomas Lee and Providence and Bain Securities, these people who went in with Broadman as his equity partners, they're not used to being in a business this long. They've been around for seven years now in, in this Warner investment, which is not longer than they usually stay. I mean, for example, Tom Lee's big money-making deal that made their reputation was he bought Snapple for $175 million and sold it 18 months later to Quaker Oats for $2 billion. You know, now that's a grand slam. You're not going to hit that every time, but that, obviously. But, you know, it's like, okay, we got some money out of this. You know, let's get out of here already. So, 
there is some sense of like Warner is in play, and also of course EMI because of its bankruptcy is in play. So the question is, there are two things on the table. One is, Bronfman has long wanted EMI. Is he going to buy EMI? Well, he's talking to Goldman Sachs about that, but at the same time, they've also talked to Goldman Sachs about finding somebody to buy Warner. So it could go one of two ways, or maybe even more ways. But the, the most obvious scenarios are you know, EMI becoming part of Warner and being owned by Bronfman and other people, or them being sold off in different things. And one of the scenarios that seems to be out there is that Colbert, Kravis, and Roberts would buy them both and roll them up. And that's not a particularly appealing scenario if you like the record business, because unlike Bronfman, those guys will not manage it with an eye to, let's be in this in the future, we like music, we think something's going to happen, we think it's good, people will always want music, there'll be ways to make money. Those guys will be, the record business is done, let's manage this thing down as small as we can and take what we can out of it. And five years from now, we'll dump off what's left. So I think you'd see a very, very different sort of management style if that's what happened. So one of our students here asked a question. Um, <clears throat> with Warner Brothers exchanging hands so many times, do you think it would be the monster record label it is if it didn't? Well, when you say monster record, you mean in terms of like, you know, its successes? Yeah. Like, like just how fast it's gotten and, and everything that it, because I've been reading about it, it's really still kind of picking up speed. You know? Well, it, you know, it's had its ups and downs, you know, and, and it's really interesting. I mean, Warner, you know, the guy who really made Warner was a guy named Mo Austin, right, who managed Warner from the late 50s into the late 80s. And um, he made Warner a place where artists wanted to go. You know, his thing was that they would like, his philosophy was follow the artist, listen to the artist, and the money will come later. You know, if you let an artist build their career, if you think they're really talented, then just follow them. You know, and that proved to be A, true, and B, extremely appealing to other artists, right? I mean, everybody, like the Classic example, the great Warner artists were like Neil Young, you know, who everybody looks at and says, well, Neil Young has all this integrity. Warner always let him make records good, bad, or indifferent. They never shut him up. You know, I want to go and deal with those people. So what happens is you start getting like, the classic example is the Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? They were on Capitol Records. Their contract's up and everybody wants to sign the Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? They had a deal in place in Columbia for a lot of money, and at the last minute decided to make a deal with Mo Austin for less money because they wanted to be there, feeling that nobody's going to interfere with our music. Same thing with R.E.M. Everybody wanted R.E.M. R.E.M. goes to Warner Brothers. Why? Because they're hands on. Right? So what happens is you get this reputation as an artist company, and then artists want to be with you. you know? So that was sort of the mojo and the magic that happened to Warner. Right? Then you know, they went through a series of guys that like because of politics ran the place didn't do so good and and then over the last you know 10 years i think they've done very well you know and uh, certainly you know green day with you know was was sort of you know last big rock record they had over there you know back when you could do those kind of tremendous numbers but it's still a place with a good reputation and they still put out good records you know i mean they've never lost that sense of like okay you know we do what we care about you know and Atlantic was always a different thing, even though there were sister labels. You know, Atlantic was always sort of like a chintzier version. You know, they didn't spend money big on artists the way they did. You know, Ahmed Erdogan, who was the legendary founder of Atlantic, this thing was, hey man, you know, just put out, make hit records and work on the radio. You know, we don't need to do all that fancy, you know, holding the artist's hands thing and telling them how great they are. Let's just put it out there. You know, so there were two different philosophies and they created two different, you know, record companies with different histories. And, Hey man, you know, Atlantic's legacy is nothing to sneeze at. You know, I mean, and, and the Rolling Stones went there, you know, because why? Well, because Armand Erdogan was the coolest guy on earth. You know, I mean, and he was. <laughs> so, so we're talking about cult of personalities here. Um, yeah. It, 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 when Lear Cohn went over, did he buy into that philosophy? No. Into, the, into that philosophy? Yeah. Lior is pretty hands off. I mean, Lior is 
administering the people who run those labels, right? I mean, he did not get along well with Tom um, Wally. Wally. Hated they didn't him. like each other. No. No. And, and um, he had control of Atlantic, though. You know, and he put his people, he put Julie Greenwald in as president of Atlantic, who was his protege. So he exerted a much greater influence in Atlantic. And in fact, you know, as I mentioned in the book, there were artists who left Atlantic and moved to Warner because their managers didn't like Leo. You know, and didn't want to have Leo having anything to do with their careers. So, you know, that stuff does go on. But the labels continue to be somewhat different and to have different attitudes, although now Tom Wally's gone. And the people who are running Warner are all Leo Cohen choices. I, uh, oh, sorry. That's all right. No, I, I, we're talking about cult of personalities and the music business. I don't know whose question this is because they didn't put their name on it, but it's a good question anyway. Um, why wouldn't Doug Morris receive the same type of notoriety as someone such as Clive Davis when he obviously had such huge impact, a huge impact on the music industry? Well, that's a, that's a really fair question. I mean, Clive Davis, you know, first of all, has assiduously courted the public. You know, he is a star. You know, he has made himself a star. He throws the big Grammy party every year. And in fact, he's interviewed in today's Los Angeles Times talking about the Grammy party. You know, he was the first. Actually, he was the first record executive to have a bio, a book. The, to, well, it's Clive. Yeah, his, 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 his Clive. Book. Clive. Um, and he takes a very active Sven Gali role in the careers. You know, I mean, I talk about this in in relationship to Bronfman, who's a behind-the-scenes guy. I mean, Bronfman, in the time I followed him, only got interested and involved in the career of one artist, and that was James Blunt. You know, when they signed James Blunt out of England, I think Bronfman really, you know, the kind of stuff Blunt writes is the kind of stuff Bronfman likes to try and write. Yeah, well, there you go. Now you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he really totally, like, got him. And like, as soon as he heard me, he goes, oh, this guy's a star. And I want to make sure we don't miss him. And they sold 12 million records. So, but, it was not a moment in which he's announcing, okay, I'm going to be Clive Davis. And I'm going to say, oh, Whitney is my creation, and Alicia Key is my creation, and I brought Carlos Santana back. And, you know, it's like a joke in the record business, you know, that Clive thinks that CD stands for Clive <laughs> Davis. You know, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, he's really sort of this, got this reputation as a terrible bore. Um, but he really does believe in the careers and nurtures the careers, you know, and that's what he does. Doug Morris doesn't do that. Doug Morris is interested in the executives, right? He is looking for the rainmakers, right? The guys that are going to find you to the guy that's going to find James Blunt, the guy that's going to find Lady Gaga. You know, he's far more interested in getting Jimmy Iovine, who runs Interscope, or, you know, in getting whatever executive he thinks is the executive he needs, you know, and building them up and giving them the tools they want and making sure that their stuff works. That's where he spends his time. He's not out getting his picture taken with U2, you know. He's making sure Jimmy Iovine's got the U2 record. So it's a totally different thing. Now, he, that being said, you know, there are different ways that these guys make their mark and make their money. You know, the fact that he's not courting the public doesn't mean he's not interested in money or in being perceived as a successful executive by the people, you know, who hire him. So it's just a different way of doing it. He just doesn't do it in public. He does it sort of in the boardroom. So continuing on that, that theme of cult of personality. Question from another student here tonight. This one regards uh, Lior Cohn, and it re it's talks about the, uh, the Ja Rule cash money click deal. And why didn't Lior just avoid the whole situation by just letting TVT release that album? It would have helped so many people. And uh, why let the greed consume your life, career, family, marriage, and what was the end, you know, for what? What was the end game? Oh, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, just, you know, if anybody's known what's being talked about, there was um, 
uh, Cash Money Click, um, which was um, Ja Rule's old band um, before he came to Def Jam. He had been on TVT, a little tiny label. One of the guys in the band uh, wound up going to prison. So they broke up, and he wound up going over to Def Jam and becoming a star. But years later, TVT Records came back and said, okay, this guy's out of prison. We'd like to put out a record. And, you know, Ferb Gotti, who was involved as the A&R man, both the TVT and the Def Jam, was interested in it and was being pushed by the guy who ran TVT and given good reasons why he should do it. And Leo just felt it wasn't in his interest to have a record out by a competitor. Now, how much of it is real and how much of it is ego, right? This is, I guess, really the core of the question, right? Why don't, why don't you let somebody do it? Right. Well, Leo's thing is like, look, when I got Ja Rule, he wasn't a star. I made him a star. He's a star for Def Jam. You got some old tapes over at TVT in a group that doesn't exist anymore. Why the hell should I let you have Ja Rule? All you're going to do is take money away from me because you're going to make people are going to buy that record instead of the next Ja Rule record. So I don't want this deal happening. So that's really it. But it's even more than that because, you know, ego does come into it. Those are all sound business reasons. These are two very aggressive guys who want what they want. Steve Gottlieb, who ran TVT, is a hard-nosed guy, very litigious, likes to get, he's a Harvard lawyer who started his record company by making an impossible record, right? TVT was television tunes. What he did was he went out and he licensed like 80 television themes and put them on a double record. So, well, everybody in the world will want to have like, you know, the Munster family theme or Maybe they want the Beverly Hillbillies. And it turned out to be a really big seller, and he made a lot of money and started this company and, of course, went on to do Nine Inch Nails and all this other stuff. And, but, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a scrapper. You know, he gets in there and he, he gets into hassles with people. And, you know, Lior, you don't have to ask him to fight twice. You know, I mean, these are two very sharp elbowed guys, two A-type personalities. You know, they're going to be button heads. So that was it. They both want what they want, and neither one wants the other one to have it. So that's essentially what happens, and it gets way out of control. It gets very personal. You know, as the book talks about it, it, it becomes a lawsuit in which Lior is personally named for damages by TVT and loses. It's later set aside and reversed. But, you know, it's really tough stuff, and it doesn't make much sense. It should have been backed off. But again, it's one of these situations where, like, the ego gets happening and then it's out of control. But there are sound business reasons to that start this. Another interesting question. Um, uh, this person said that uh, one of the things that stories that stood out for them in the book was the rivalry between Sylvia Rohn and Lior. And uh, as referencing the Ashante tweet debut albums released simultaneously at the same time back in uh, 2002. And um, I wondered what, you know, what was the upside of that? What was the point in that? And is it you're asking, is it common for rivals to be in such conflict uh, on things like that? And can you recall anything, any conflicts or battles similar to that other than that one? Well, I mean, you know, the big one that the book recounts other than that is the one, of course, between Jimmy Iovine and Lior, you know, who were both over at, at uh, Universal, uh, Universal Music Group at the same time, Lior running Island Def Jam and Jimmy Iovine running Interscope. Uh, and they're both trying to poach each other's acts in their own. I mean, they're at the same company, for God's sake. Uh, it just makes no sense whatsoever. But, you know, you get these guys who are what? Don't forget that the way the record industry paid its executives was bonuses based on your chart share and your sales figures, right? So, Jimmy sees that I have this act and he's trying to take the guy out of the act and put him on his label. He's going to be taking my money. And it's really just like that. I mean, these guys, you know, they don't think about art, they think about their bonuses. You know, that's what motivates people, is money. And certainly in the music industry, that's what motivates people. So, you know, it's ego, it's money, it's like my turf, your turf, and it gets out of hand very quickly. So, yeah, you know, the Sylvia thing is small potatoes, I think, compared to Jimmy Iovine and, and uh, 
and Leor. I mean, I, those guys really kind of went at it. And by the way, I think Doug Morris probably encouraged it, you know, who's their boss. You know, I think he liked having these two guys going against each other and, you know, pushing each other. You know, I like playing them off each other. You talked about the economic structure and bonuses. So, you know, there's always been the theory that the music industry, one of the reasons it can't reinvent itself is because the salaries and the status quo, everybody's trying to protect their, you know, their healthy seven-figure salaries and whatnot. And so reinventing and taking a business that was predicated on a $15 item and now it's down to a dollar item, it's hard to justify keeping those salaries at that point. So would you agree that right now that's probably one of the reasons the industry is in such a mess because everybody's just trying to protect their backyard? Well, trying to protect their backyard and also manage it through a transition period. I mean, it gets very complicated. There is this personal ego money part of it, and that's real. You know, I mean, look, Lior Cohen makes 4 or $5 million a year. Well, Doug Morris used to make $19 million a year. I mean, he was making more than the president of Ford Motor Company. I mean, it's just kind of crazy the money that was paid in the record industry. So when you hear, okay, Lear makes 4 or $5 million, well, if you're used to hearing record company salaries, it didn't sound like so much money. You know, because maybe Jimmy Iovine wanted $10 million or something like that. But the question is, if, if I understand you, you know, in the economics and where it's going, right, everything is shrinking down and shrinking down. And it's getting to the point where the next guy that comes along is not going to get four or five million dollars. I mean, whoever is the guy after Lior is not getting that kind of money. You know, maybe he'll get two million dollars. You know, and what happens after that? You know, and it's the same sort of thing everywhere in the business. You know, whether you're an artist manager or an attorney or a music publisher or you know, you're doing line work in the business, you're a promotion man, or, you know, whatever, you're a product manager, whatever your function is, you know, those levels are going to be dropping and have been dropping, you know, as, as you go along. And it's endemic to the entire business. I mean, you know, I've been recently trying to get people interested in an article that I'm kind of shocked I can't sell, you know. And the article is this. Ten years ago, if you were Tom Petty, you can expect to sell five to eight million copies of your record. Today, you might be able to sell three to five hundred thousand. What's your recording budget? In other words, our record budgets, as they shrink, are going to limit the type of record that gets made. Will it still be possible to make whatever big budget record you want? You know, pick. Dark Side of the Moon, or you know, pick Abbey Road, or whatever big budget record you go, wow, this is the great record you could make in a recording studio with a great producer. I mean, you know, I went out to lunch with, with a guy I know named Cliff Bernstein, who's a big rock manager. And somebody, he, he manages, among his acts, he manages Metallica and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I was teasing him, I said, you have the last two acts in America that can afford to spend six months in the studio with Rick Rubin. No one can make that record anymore. Now, I'm not saying that like Tusk by Fleetwood Mac is a better record than, you know, Zen Arcade by Husker Du, you know, which was made for like $15 in 10 minutes, and it's great. But you can only make one of them now, right? You can't make Tusk now. You know, it's almost like Quincy Jones is the Cecil B. DeMille's of the record business. You know, no one's going to make those big pictures anymore. No one's going to make those big records anymore. You know, what does it mean that you can't afford to make something that you know you could? You know, what does it mean that these choices for artists are shrinking? You know, and surprisingly, I can't get anybody to write, let me write this article. <laughs> and, 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 and again, going back to the film analogy, it's like, look, I love independent films. You know, it's like, I like Jim Jarmusch, he makes great movies, you know. But my favorite movie is Chinatown, an American movie. And if you gave Jim Jarmusch a Jim Jarmusch budget of a million and a half dollars and said, okay, make me a film about corruption in America and Los Angeles, he couldn't make Chinatown, you know, because it can't be done for that money by that guy. You know, it has to be done in Hollywood with this and with that, with actors and directors and name producers and craftspeople. And it's the same with music, you know. And it's the same in the business. All this stuff is shrinking down. 
and it's being done on a smaller and smaller scale. And this is the part, you know, that really sort of, I think consumers have been willfully blind to. You know, the fact is you get what you pay for. You know, and if you don't want to pay for music, we're only going to get music that people have made as cheaply and quickly as they can because they can't afford to lose that much money on a record no one will pay for. Now, if you're willing to take records that are just advertisements to come to a concert, that's kind of the world we're moving to. Because the fact of the matter is, though, is that the measure of careers up until this moment for the last 50 years have been what you do in a studio. That's where you do your lasting work, generally, unless you're the Grateful Dead, right? Or, you know, whatever, Fish, I mean, jam bands, you know, there were obviously exceptions to this. But, you know, it's like, look, this has been the meaningful place that people do their work, and now you say, I don't want to buy it, I don't want to pay for it, make it for free, make it as cheap as you can, I don't give a shit. Maybe you should. Right, anyhow. That to me is more salient than what happens to the salary of New York Owen. That's true. Um, <clears throat> I think you kind of answered this, but a little more specific. Uh, another question from the students. Do you feel that Mo Austin's client-oriented strategy proved more beneficial to Warner's than Morgado's business-focused strategy? And then um, is cited in Austin's good relations with clients such as the Chili Peppers and Morgado's alienation of his co-workers through his self-promotion. Yeah, I mean, look, Morgado was a manager who was put in by Steve Ross, who was then the head of Warner Communications, you know, basically to control costs and, and to keep these guys on a little tight on leash. What had happened was, you know, Steve Ross had empowered all the record company executives and let them do whatever they want, have the illusion that they ran their own companies. He gave Mo Austin and Ahmed Erdogan and uh, Jack Holtzman and Electra tremendous freedom to run the companies however they wanted to. And he paid them extremely well. I, mean, I, was, I knew Jerry Wexler, who was Ahmed's partner in Atlantic Records, and once they sold it, they had sold Atlantic for $17 million, and Jerry like, thought you know, this was the greatest thing that had ever happened, and he took his share of the money and he went to Florida and he was never going to work again except on anything he wanted to. He was going to produce a Bob Dylan record or a Doug Somm record or you know, something like that he would do, you know, or a Rico record, right, whatever he turned them on. But he wasn't going to come to the office, and he certainly wasn't going to run around with that idiot Steve Ross. Well, you know, Jerry completely missed the boat, because, you know, Ahmed continued to make a fortune from Steve Ross, and Mo Austin, and all these guys, because Ross grossly overpaid them and let them do what they wanted. You know, why? Because they could get talent. You know, it was this thing that Doug Morris later saw. Okay, these executives, they know the market, they know they're important. Let's keep them happy. So that becomes the sort of beginning of that. And later on, they went through a scare at Warner, which was Atari. Atari had become a big part of Warner, and then all of a sudden it collapsed. And they had hemorrhaging billions of dollars now, firing thousands of people. And suddenly Steve Ross gets a little bit of religion. And he's like, you know, the guy who cleans up Atari for him is Bob Morgano. And he says to Bob afterwards, okay, you want to be in the record business? You could be the chairman of the record group and just kind of keep these guys a little tighter leash. Well, these guys have never been on a leash. Hmm. You know, Mo Austin doesn't want to have some guy telling him what to sign and to be schedules and to get in the way and telling him that there's a more scientific way to do this. What the hell does this guy know? He doesn't want to listen to him. And it's very ugly and it's very bad. Uh, and, and in fact, it was just a disaster for the company. I mean, there was no reason for it to happen. And, you know, the loss of Austin was not a good thing for Warner. But I would like to point out an interesting coda, which is Mo Austin and his protege, Lenny Walker, who they wanted to take his place and who decided not to stay and to leave as well when Mo left, went to work for David Geffen at DreamWorks Records. Now, Mo Austin was a great record executive, and he made Warner. But lightning did not strike twice. DreamWorks lost, I have heard, $500 million. Mo Austin. David Geffen. <coughs> Can't miss guys. Didn't happen. So canonizing Mo as this great record executive 
Um, it, it serves a lot of purposes. I mean, A, the records are good. There's no denying that the records are good and that it made Warner a very fertile place for music. That's good. But it also is in the interest of, you know, sort of romanticizing the business. And it's good for the artists, too. I mean, look, you know, Neil Young is the guy that keeps making out like a bandit on this. Because every time they need to show they're serious, Neil gets a new contract. You know, and at one point I heard that, you know, they gave him back his publishing. I mean, they gave him a $20 million contract on a guy who, like, his sales are negligible. You know, but it's basically like, well, we want to be Neil's label. You know, he's our mascot, he's our guy. <clears throat> but with all the, you know, the, the good things said about Mo, it always struck me odd that Warner's never, even to this day, really does not have a footprint in the black music business. Well, they tried. I, you well, know, yeah, no, they always tried, but it was yeah. stumbled. Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting question. I I, I really can't answer that. You know, uh, I mean, and they certainly have interesting black artists over the years. I mean, you know, there's an argument to be made that Prince is the greatest black artist in the last forty years. You know, since James Brown. I mean, they had him. They they had him when he was seventeen. They knew what he was. And they let him be himself. So. Um, <clears throat> another question, in chapter 11, you're quoting uh, Brofman as saying, <clears throat> it's, it's easy to gain market share when a competitor stumbles, but the problem is that we have not figured out how to recreate a dynamic industry. It's better for the industry if Sony BMG is healthy. Do you agree with that statement even in today's indie mentality marketplace? And do you think the industry's stability affects the mainstream music we hear on a daily basis? Uh, yes to both those questions. Um, uh, I was impressed with the company that Lior and Edgar run. It's intelligently managed within financial limits. You can carp about the money that Lior gets paid. You know, I think I've made an argument that it's not a lot compared to what other people get in the industry. And you have to get somebody to run the company who knows what they're doing. I don't think you can really say that they've fleeced the company. You know, they've managed the company intelligently. And they have continued to invest in artists. More than probably I would. I mean, you know, there's a certain point at which you say, man, is this thing growing or not? But they sign artists and they, this is the business we're in, this is the business we're in, this is the business we're in. And they keep going at it. Sony BMG has been poorly run. EMI has been poorly run. To the detriment of artists, to the detriment of people who like music. Right? If you can't do it, what good is it? You know? And, and that, to me, is like, okay, if these companies were healthy, if these companies were run by people who knew what they were doing, everybody would be better off. And that, I, I think, is just logical, and I agree with it. I mean, the part that, you know, he's had it both ways now. I mean, Warner, when EMI is weak, when Sony BMG is weak, picks up market share. So he certainly benefited from it. You know, he's saying the politic thing, which is, I'd rather benefit from being good in a good market to being good in a bad market. Back to Doug Morris and black music. Uh, it seemed when he was running Time Warner, he really had a handle on the black music in Atlantic. And then when he went working for Edgar over at Universal, um, one of the first things he did was he brought in black music, you know, by, you know, the label that Warners didn't want to hold on to. It was too controversial. So given his track record of building market share, I call, kind of call it the secret sauce, is because black music s sells in right. big numbers. Um, if he is allowed to leave his current position, as those of you reading the, the newspapers know that Doug Morris has been offered the opportunity to go jump ship now that his heir apparent has taken over at Universal, and he will now, he's been offered the position to run Sony BMG. So, Sony BMG right now, at least on the Sony side, you could argue, hasn't been in the, in the urban or black business in, in a real way in a long time. Would one expect to see, once Doug goes over there, that might be one of the first things you'd see him you know, deal with? Yes. The question, which I can't answer, right? 
looking at Doug's track record, his move is to reach out for an established black record executive to come and give them that, okay? He will be out looking for L.A. Reid, as he did to run Def Jam, or Sylvia Roan to run East West over at, uh, you know, then Electra over, over at Warner. I mean, the whole idea is, okay, find an executive I can trust who knows what they're doing in this particular sphere. I don't know who the likely candidate is for him to bring to Sony. You, you may have thoughts on this, but I, I just don't. But likely that you see that as his, one of his initial moves. Well, he's not, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you would certainly think so. Now, you know, the question is, you know, if he comes over there, you know, what else happens? You know, I mean, what does he do? Uh, are the people at Epic or Columbia or whoever is there at the moment, right? I mean, who keeps, who stays, who goes? And are there any loyalists? I mean, there are certainly some people we expect to bring with him, you know, from over at uh, Universal. You know, what does that do to the other people that exist over at Sony are we going to have this sort of back and forth exodus where, you know, the people at Sony are going to Universal and the people at Universal are going to Sony and, and what? And the, to the detriment of everybody for two years. Barry Weiss. Barry Weiss's name is getting thrown in there, right. You know, but, I, I, you know, I don't know. I also heard, uh, what's his name from Zamba was uh, interested. But, well, that was, you know, that was rumored in the UK. Rumor, yeah, it just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I don't think I so. I mean, you know, it's kind of like turning a winning hand into a losing hand. Right. And he, yeah. But, uh, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be interesting. I think what's notable is that if you look at the Sony current structure, there's no president of Epic Records. Eric, Epic Records is like a fish without a head. Right. And they don't seem to be any rush to fill that position. Well, with maybe, maybe that's where it's going to start. I mean, because look, that is what he is. He's a hirer of executive talent. Well, you, you know, pointed that out earlier. Casts, right. We need this part of the market. Who does that? You know, who knows the artists? Who this? Who that? You know, it's going to be somebody. I mean, maybe it'll be you know uh, what's his name from uh, Violator. I mean, he'd be an interesting Correct. choice. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. I I, I just <clears throat> the history of Doug Morris is fascinating. Yeah. I mean coming from a small little indie label as a songwriter and building himself up to where he is today, he's considered the, one of the top executives. He is the top executive. He is the top executive, you know, doubt. Speaking of executives and cult of personality, you're quoted as saying that there'll never be another Ahmet Erdogan. And why? why? What makes you say that? I mean, well, what... The context in which I said that was that there'll never be another Ahmet Erdogan as long as there's no way to make money selling recordings. Right. Ahmed Erdogan was a man who sold recordings and records, and at the moment, records have no monetary value. So what he did in terms of being motivated to bring these artists forward, to make their work lasting on vinyl at the time, or shellac, or wh wherever he started, uh, you know, there's no financial footing on which to do that at this point. I mean, you might say, gee, Merge Records is great. you know. Merge Records, can it get any bigger than it is right now? I mean, you know, they've had the outsized success with Arcade Fire, and they have a good roster, and the record industry is shrinking. You know, it's not like covers can go on to the next step. You know, covers can only reach as high as, like, the top of the record industry, and that's always shrinking recently. So my thing is there'll never be an Ahmed Erdogan, you know, as long as there's no way to sell the recorded work of artists in a meaningful way. Now, you know, Ahmed had certain unique characteristics, um, and, and he, he was a truly fascinating guy. And, you know, I said before the Rolling Stones wanted to be with him because he was the coolest guy on earth. I, I mean, I went to a memorial service for him that I described at the back of this book, and the thing that I was so struck with is that, you know, how could, like, Michael Bloomberg and Kid Rock you know, both be friends with the same guy, you know? I mean, it's such a weird thing, you know? And, and the stories that are being told about this guy, I mean, you know, Mick Jagger's telling a story about, like, scalping tickets with him outside the Olympics in Turkey, you know? And somebody else is telling a story about being in a Bangkok whorehouse with him, you know? And Ben Midler's telling a story about him singing at a Chinese, 
is singing a dirty song at a Chinese official banquet in Beijing. You know, and I mean, he was just got, lived a charmed, amazing, amazing life. You know, and Jack Holtzman, who runs, who started Electra Records, you know, swore to me that Ahmed could fall asleep in an elevator standing up. You know, the guy didn't sleep at night. He would go 24 hours a day and go out partying, and he'd show up the next day at work, and he'd wear the same clothes for three or four days. He'd never go home. He was a crazy maniac, you know? And I and, uh, just happened to look like this dapper guy in a Brooks Brothers suit, but he was crazy than anybody he signed. And, you know, Jack said the guy could literally, the elevator door would close, and between the lobby and 27, where he got off in Atlantic, Ahmed would be asleep. And it's true. I, I had a friend who uh, was the managing director of Atlantic in the UK, and he would dread when Ahmed came because he knew he'd get no sleep. Because Ahmed came, got off the plane, and he would just keep rolling, and and stay up all night, and you know, get by with a couple hours of sleep. It, it was it was an amazing guy. I mean, you know, and his dad was the Turkish ambassador to the United States. He was educated in the Sorbonne. I mean, he was a guy from another world. You know, he was urbane and educated. But, you know, he was just like in love with the, you know, the best traits were found in the gutter. You know, I mean, that was his thing. And he always had his young niece with him. Yeah. But, but they were always different. <laughs> God bless him. Um, question. Uh, you, those of us who have read the book, talk about uh, Jean-Marie Messier. <clears throat> Would your analysis of be, say, he was basically a dishonest person? Well, from the outside and f the financial records, it would seem so. Uh, and, and by dishonest, there are two ways to see it. I mean, you can't look at the guy and say, you know, well, actually you can. I mean, Bronfman thought he was financially dishonest, you know. At the end, uh, to get him out, they made it, you know, he claimed that Messier insisted on a ridiculous severance package that was just blackmail. You know, and he said, well, let's give it to him and we'll sue him for it later. It just can't stand up. But we've got to get him out of here right now. You know, and, and so there is that sense of dishonesty. What happens is the guy really seems to lose, you know, his sort of bearings. You know, he's making deal after deal after deal. And it's hard to remember, you know, considering what the economic moment is now versus what the economic moment was in 1999 and 1998 when you're riding, you know, that internet bubble, you know, when, when AOL and Vivendi are trading at 70 times cash flow. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's astounding. You know, they've literally got funny money because everybody wants to throw their money at the internet. So the biggest names in the internet holdings are attracting the most money, and we still see it, you know, albeit with, you know, Google, which makes a better case for why you should invest with them, or Apple, I mean, the stock is really, really high, you know? And, of course, we've just seen this crazy Goldman Sachs evaluation of Facebook, you know, and what they think Facebook is worth. You know, it's, you can see this, this sort of same psychology at work now. But Messier is basically being offered a blank check. Why? Because everybody wants to invest in the internet, so he's gonna give them what they want. And he, before he even digests this Universal Seagram's deal, he's off buying a telecom company in Morocco. Right. You know, he's off buying book publishing companies. He's off buying another studio, websites. I mean, things that can't possibly be integrated and digested. And it gets to the point where he's literally spending a billion and a half dollars a month on new acquisitions. You know, it's a rate that no one can justify, and he just seems to have sort of gotten into this megalomania that he's, you know, got a bottomless pit of money and he's just going to make this the dream company. And it just collapses. I mean, they have to, they start lying about their finances and not telling the board what's going on. And, you know, before long, it's a runaway train. So is he dishonest? I think he's dishonest, but I also think he's dishonest with himself. You know, I don't think he's really holding himself accountable for his own actions, you know, and, and that I think is really where he gets into trouble. It's not like he's trying to cheat somebody, you know, I just think he's lost control. Hmm. Later on he tries to cheat somebody. Right, right. Um, by the way, this is not a spectator um, sport here, it's just participatory, so 
if any of you have questions, please. How long did you follow Brock? Four years. Yeah, and, and that's longer than I wanted to. You know, I mean, you know, what happened was I thought they were going to make a deal for EMI. And I, and I lived in fear that, like, I was going to turn my book in and the next month they were going to buy EMI. And my book would come out and the deal would be done and there'd be nothing about it in the book. So I kept on putting off finishing the book and finishing the book, hoping there was a transforming deal that I wasn't going to miss. And finally I just said, I can't afford to do this anymore. You know, and I just did it and, you know, as you can see, they still haven't bought EMI, so that was okay. Anybody else? All right, so we'll go back to the uh, questions that were brought in. Um, <coughs> Edgar Broffman was uh, looking for someone who could aid him in making money post-Napster. He was one of the biggest opponents uh, uh, to file sharing and really set out to demonize uh, P2P programs and its users. Yet, when his wealthy kids admitted to file sharing, he did not sue his children. He continues to say that Warners will not uh, go to a freemium program how do you think Warner's will prevail with that mentality leading the, the, the brigade? You know, I think Warner has been the most interested in trying things of any of the companies. I mean, part of it is that I had an inside seat and was watching them consider things. But I would also hear all that conversations about things they were trying to get other record companies to do that they couldn't, you know? And frequently where it would break down was Universal. You know, Universal, Morris wants to get paid. He wants to have, you know, the best seat at the table, you know. I mean, that is basically his philosophy. And the classic example is that there was a deal early on through BMG for the record companies to take control of Napster. And the feeling was the record companies will share ownership of Napster, will charge $10 a month. Here's this thing, everybody knows what Napster is. It's a way for us to like grab a piece of this marketplace. Let's do this. And everybody goes, yeah, okay, let's do this. And then a couple of weeks after everybody says, yeah, let's do this, Universal comes back and goes, you know, the deal is for us to all split this company equal, but we're the biggest record company. We should have the biggest share of this company. You know, it's just not right. At which point everybody else went, and that was the end of it. You know, it was just like, no, no way, no way, no way. So, you know, every time there is this thing, it's like the industry can't move together. There are, first of all, certain legal controls. You know, you can't collude, you know, if you're in the same business. So you can't get together and, like, set pricing policy. So there are these legal things to be satisfied. However, they can be done. The problem is that these guys hate each other. They're competitors. You know, it's like, well, you know, why do American auto companies get beat up by foreign automakers? Well, because Ford and GM don't like each other, they don't want to sit down at the same table and do anything that's going to help the other one. They'd rather go it alone. And it's the same thing in the record industry. You know, They just don't want to help each other. So that sort of getting these guys to work in concert becomes really difficult. One of the ideas that Warner had that I thought was really clever was a thing called Chorus. Right? And what they wanted to do was they wanted to go, now you guys go to college. Now you guys, how many of you guys live on campus? There's this computer school? Okay. You know, I mean, I got kids who go through school, right? So it's like you get the bill and there's like all these add-ons, right? Whether it's like copy fees, you know, or gym fees, or cable TV fees, or internet fees, right? Blah, 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 when you get your bill. Right? It's another 800 bucks or something on there in most places. It's like Warner's deal was, hey, you know, we started fighting with the colleges early on because why? Because they all had the big computers and that's where music downloading really got going. Why don't we go back to the colleges and make a deal like they have for cable TV? You know, we'll give you a blanket license. Your students can download all the music they want. All we want is a nominal fee. Pay us $30 a semester. Your students can have access to all the music they want on the internet. We will bless it. Well, this is a very clever idea. Why? Because as soon as the universities sign on to this, you can turn around to Congress or the FCC or whoever and say, look, the right of paying for this copyright is recognized by universities. Grant us the same rights. Make Cablevision give us this. You know, make all the satellite companies and cable providers 
give us a fee because it's recognized by the universities. They understand copyright. You should too. Well, it's a great strategy. Except nobody wants to do this. What? Well, it's Warner's idea and they're administering it and I don't want to get in Warner's boat. Hey, you know, fiddling while Rome burns is kind of the story here. So, you know, I think when I look at it from the inside, I'm frequently impressed by what Warner's tries to do. You know, so to say that, well, they never went with freemium, I mean, hey, they bought Lala, you know, I mean, they tried to get some things going, you know, and, and that was a free service. You know, they were willing to try things, and they could just never get, A, the industry behind them, or B, a model that could in some way pay for itself, because Lala's thing was going to be advertising. And, you know, when you looked at their blue sky numbers that they couldn't even make, right? I mean, the La La plan that Waters was willing to sign on for, for them to make the same amount of money they made selling one album, you'd have to listen to La La for 93 hours. Okay? So that's pretty goddamn close to freemium. You know? I mean, they were willing to do that. They couldn't find anybody to pay for advertising on that. They couldn't even justify 93 hours worth. At that, I mean, that's how minuscule the advertising was. Well, you know, all the advertising money goes to Google. You know, nobody else is making any money. So even YouTube, right, they negotiated money deals from YouTube. Right. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm shocked. There's that great Waterman essay that, that turns up in the book, right? Everybody knows what Rick Rowling is still, right? Okay, the guy who wrote Never Gonna Give You Up which has been shown on YouTube like 50 million times at the time he wrote this article. He did an article about, okay, hey, YouTube says they pay royalties. I'm the guy who wrote Never Gonna Give You Up. It's been shown 50 million times on YouTube. You know what my royalty check was? I'm in England, 11 pounds. Okay? I mean, how's anybody gonna make a living? It's crazy, man. This is replacing record sales? 50 million views is 11 pounds. Hey, they got, get a paper route. <laughs> but what did Edgar say to his kids who were illegally filing, he, uh, downloading? You know, now, see, this is Edgar's downfall. Now, you know, imagine you're Will Tannis, Edgar's vice president of publicity, right? I mean, Edgar is asked the question, have your children ever downloaded? And like an idiot, he says, yes. Instead of, you know, I don't know. Saying, ah, oh, geez, I, I certainly hope not. Or something bland. You know, why? Well, because he's an earnest guy. You know, so, I mean, you're his publicist, publicist and you're sitting there slapping your head, you know. <laughs> but, but of course, everybody tees off on him that, well, why don't you sue your kids? You know, it's like, okay, I, I deserve it. Next. <laughs> you know, but, but it's like anybody else, you know, would just not answer the question. Yeah. You're the, the head of Warner Music, right? And yeah. you are a billionaire, and your children have billions of dollars. Right. And yet they illegally download music. How do you get the college kid who can't afford a meal? To it's a loser. That's the whole thing. I mean, you know, look, suing kids, you know, it's a loser. You know, and, and, and the whole notion that you're going to sue people who are your customers, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And, it, and it, if you trace it, right, and you say, okay, Sue Napster out of business, okay, Sue LimeWire out of business, because why? Because they're really constituted as businesses, right? I mean, these companies are all out there trying to get angel funding, you know, and investment firms to put money in them, and they're pretending that the music online is just like some piece of gold they found sitting on the ground. It doesn't belong to anybody, I just found it. That's not true. But, it's a different deal when it's somebody's a consumer, right? You can say, okay, you don't have a right to it, you know, and make that case. But when you start suing people, it's, it's, it's really like, you might have the legal right to do it, but it doesn't make any sense, you know? And, and that was a wrong turn. And, you know, and what they did, you know, stop doing it at the RIAA, you know, and I think everybody, you know, wishes they never had done it, you know? I mean, that, that's, that's just the fact of the matter. Now, it's true though, they did stop all these companies from starting up, you know. And in fact, 
as an antidote to that, when Apple iTunes comes along, they're trying it wanted to make deals with people and say, look, we'd like to have three or four more other services like iTunes. We don't particularly like iTunes. 99 cents, man, eh, doesn't get me very excited. You know, can you come up with something where we can sell albums? You know, packages, things for like nine bucks or 10 bucks or some enhanced thing with concert tickets or, you know, give us anything that makes sense, right? And they're encouraging people to do that, you know? But the fact is nobody can figure out how to do it. You know, I mean, it's really been a bust. And where I think Edgar really miscalculated, right? I think what he sold his partners was, we made mistakes on the internet. We're gonna get a second bite at the Apple with cell phones. People are gonna use cell phones to download music. They're gonna to wanna to order music from the phone company. Let's not make the mistakes we made where we tried to like own the services on the internet and it didn't work. Let's let the phone companies do their thing encourage them, tell them we'll do it, and then, you know, who cares if record stores disappear? You know, we'll have six billion people with cell phones, you know, and if they spend a hundred dollars a year on music, each of them will be richer than ever. Except the phone companies never got there. You know, when somebody finally comes along and has a reasonable service, oh my God, it's Apple again, and I hate them. You know, I mean, Nokia is trying stuff that comes with music. They can never get it off the ground. Virgin had a deal, got kiboshed. You know, the American companies, they're publicly owned. So they all have to show profits every quarter. They don't want to invest in things that aren't making money right now. They, they, they say, okay, we know that content's going to be big for us later. You know, we're going to keep, like, you know, making these ridiculous deals for, you know, this is the basic service and text and this other crap that's around now. So it turned out to not be there, you know, that second bite at the apple. Another question related to this in the class. In regards to the Napster controversy, do you feel Metallica's lawsuit was negative exposure for the band? I was there. You know, I had an assignment to write about Sean Fanning for a magazine that's since been out of business, but I, you know, I heard that Metallica was doing this thing, so I, I literally like went down to the airport and bought a plane ticket to Silicon Valley, and I was there the next morning when, when uh, Lars Ulrich showed up, you know, with his boxes of lists of people, you know, who violated Napster, uh, who violated the, and downloaded Metallica, um, and it was a bit of theater, but the theater was on the other side as well. Anybody seen, you know, Social Network, right? You know, Sean Parker's big character in there, right? Sean Parker was Sean Fanning's buddy and right-hand guy at, you know, at Napster. Now, I didn't introduce myself as a journalist. I'm just somebody in the crowd. And I leaned up against the wall right next to Sean Parker because I wanted to hear what this guy was saying while all this was going on with Lars Ulrich. And, you know, they were egging it on. I mean, they were definitely trying at Napster, you know, to demonize these guys. They had people from the building down there yelling at them, pretending that they were consumers. I mean, it was theater on both sides, you know, and, and they were really, you know, pretty vile, you know, Napster in their, in their own way. I mean, they, they were literally, you know, yelling, you know, at them, you know, fuck you, you're too rich, you know, that kind of thing. And, and it, it was really pretty ugly. Now, I don't think there's been any lasting damage to Metallica. I mean, if you look at what they do concert-wise, you know, their business is as strong as ever. I think they're respected as musicians. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of posturing and a lot of the behavior is kind of silly. I mean, you know, I, mean, I got interviewed, when this book came out, I was interviewed at the Wired website, you know? And, and you know, and I made the remark, I was like, oh, you know, to this day, you know, you can't mention Lars Ulrich's name online without 60 people going on in that comic chat park going, oh, he's a goddamn tool. You know, it's like, hey, look, man, the guy's absolutely right. You know, I mean, he said something which is, you know, we think the future of this is this and that people will, in fact, get music and we will give music over the internet. But, you know, it's not yours and you should have asked. It's, it was that simple, you know? And I think that they were really, you know, brave to do it. And in fact, they were, I, you know, I mentioned earlier their manager, Cliff Bernstein. You know, Cliff Bernstein and Peter Minch are the guys who managed Metallica. You know, and they saw this very, very clearly. I mean, 
they were, for my money, you know, the guys driving the whole Metallica confrontation, their managers, because they looked at it and they said, oh, oh, no, no, this is a bunch of venture capitalists from Silicon Valley are going to eat the record industry's lunch. You know, if you let these guys have this stuff, there is no record business. They saw it immediately. And the record industry wasn't going to do it. The RIA was going back and forth. But they were really like, somebody has to say this is wrong. And Metallica agreed to do it. You know, and, and I think certainly, you know, they have the right to say it. So I, I think uh, there are people who are still pissed at them. And I think those people don't really understand how artists make a living or don't want to know. I mean, I, I, you know, I had a very interesting thing happen, which was, you know, I spent so much time thinking about why do people behave the way they do about music. I mean, look, we all love music, and, you know, we all download music, and we love it, and we want it, and we want to have it around, you know? But it's like, you know, long term, you've got to figure out a way to support it, otherwise it's just not going to be there in any meaningful way. And why don't people want to accept that? You know, why is this thing about... Well, you know, give me the music for free and maybe I'll buy a t-shirt and maybe I'll go to a concert and, you know, there's a book called To the Finland Station. It was written by Edmund Wilson back in the 40s. And it's a history of left-wing thought from the French Revolution up to the Russian Revolution. And I read this book after I finished this. And he starts talking about a reactionary period after the French Revolution when the emerging bourgeoisie, which is mostly shop owners, are at odds with most of the people in Paris. Why? Well, because they're cheap and they don't want to pay for anything. And I thought, oh my god, this is nothing new. No one likes to pay for anything. Right? Well, the reason we have downloading is because you don't have to pay. You know, it's just that simple, right? And no one is thinking about the ramifications of it. You know, and it's ever been this way, and it's not just about music. You know, it's about anything you can get for free. And I even, you know, make the crack in the book that, like, you know, the day somebody figures out how to get into an NFL game without getting arrested, you know, there'll be no more NFL tickets either. You know, so that's all it is. It's just opportunity. And a lot of the righteous indignation, I think, is people self-justifying what they're doing. They feel a little guilty about it. It's like, well, the record industry, they kind of suck, so yeah. I guess this is cool. Yeah. Uh, it's a way to, you know, make yourself feel good for what you're doing. Justified. Anybody have any questions out there? I'll take spiritual questions, too. All right. We'll go back to uh, another question here. Um, <clears throat> in starting Def Jam and trying to build the company... Uh, Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin would partner together along with Lior Cohn. Who do you believe has the strongest knowledge of the business? And do you think the company would still be successful or even more successful if the three of them stayed together? Well, the three of them really couldn't be together. I mean, you know, Lior really only kind of rises because Rick is leaving. Um, and, you know, there's that, that great, you know, uh, story... Um, where, where uh, Russell Simmons, you know, is in the studio and Lior and Rick Rubin are warring. And, you know, he turns to somebody who works for the company and goes, oh, man, my Jews are fighting. And it was like, these guys just really couldn't get along, you know. And, and, and it was really, it's kind of a fascinating thing. I mean, I don't know if it's ever been talked about, you know, but I had a, a very close friend, you know, there were, years ago, the first major thing that was written about Rick Rubin was a long profile in the Village Voice. And in it, you know, Rick's father kind of intimated that Russell Simmons was not big on Jews. And, you know, a friend of Russell said to me, you know, that is so, so, so far from the truth. Not, he's not anti-Semitic. He says, in fact, if anything, he's a Semitophile. You know, on some level, Russell feels like, you know, Jewish merchants have are aware of something that people in the black community as businessmen have not dealt with. You know, that there's some sort of, you know, he feels like Jews have bonded in business in a way that black men need to bond. And he's trying to figure out what this thing is. And he always wants to have a Jewish partner. And in fact, he always has had Jewish partners. And it's like a strange, weird quirk. You know, that it's like he just, you know, whether it's a blanket or whatever, because certainly Russell is an extraordinarily confident guy in his own right, and has his own strengths, you know. Uh, but the question is, who makes Def Jam? 
I don't think he can really answer it. You know, I mean, Leo very generously calls you know Rick the architect of Def Jam. You know, and certainly it's his label before you know Russell is there. He's got the first record that says Def Jam. You know, it's it's his Jazzy Jeff record. You know, that that he's distributed. And then, you know, he, he of course wants to sign LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys and he's trying to get Russell to be in business with him. You know, and that's where the whole thing really gets rolling. But those two guys do what they do. You know, Russell was really into the promotion end and he would do things and he would like make the connections for Def Jam to be successful by, you know, wooing this club owner and getting to know that this jockey down in Carolina and this guy in Los Angeles and that guy in Houston. And, you know, he really spent a lot of time doing that, but he also was out, you know, living his life and partying. And Rick Rubin, he only wants control insofar as it allows him to live the life he wants and to make the records he wants and keep the hours he wants. None of those guys are going to show up at 9 o'clock in the morning and open the office door. Leo Cohen is that guy. You know, so basically, you know, these guys are architects, you know, and you might say Leo is the janitor, but really he's more than that. You know, he's sort of the, the, the building manager. You know, he's the guy who makes sure that it all works and runs. I mean, and it's the same thing for Julie Greenwald, you know, who's later his protege, who becomes the president of Atlantic and later chairman. You might have seen a profile this past Sunday in the New York Times. You know, she can make the trains run on time. You know, she's not a person who's going to, like, be out there looking for the next great act. That ain't what she does. You know, she makes sure it gets done. And that's what Lira does. But those other guys, they're dreamers, you know, and they dream the thing. He's just a great facilitator who makes sure those things can happen for them. Another question uh, from the class. Uh, chapter 7 talks a lot about Napster and the rise of digital music. Okay? Do you feel that eventually CDs will no longer be sold and music will only be available digitally? And do you think that Mariah Carey's charm bracelet would have had better sales if digital recordings didn't take over the industry? Wow. Probably on charm bracelet, just because everything was starting to go down. Although, you know, that wasn't really Leo's métier, you know, to do that kind of stuff. So I, I, I think it would, might have done better if L.A. Reid was really the record label. Right? I mean, I, I, you know, certainly she did do better when he came along let, let, and ran the label. Let's see what happens with the J-Lo record. Because that was on Sony. She misstepped. Right. Now, Never LA, over there. Yeah, yeah, be interesting. But, you know, it, that, that's what those guys are good at, you know. Um, and that was not what Leo was good at. Now, I certainly hope there's something to buy. I mean, I don't, I don't like CDs. I think one of the reasons that downloading has been so intense is that CDs are not a loved format. You know, it's like they're convenient, but they're brittle, and they're ugly, and the graphics suck, and, you know, it just doesn't feel permanent. You know, it's not like a nice piece of product. Nobody loves CDs the way people used to love vinyl records, you know? I mean, people got really attached to vinyl records, and, you know, wow, look at the graphics, and wow, you can clean your pot on it, you know, and all these other great things you can do with records that you can't do with CDs. Um, but it was convenience. Now you don't need it. But it's like, I say in the book, and I really mean it, it's like the experience of putting 10,000 files, you know, on a terabit storage unit. Hmm. I mean, it's great to have everything you want to hear. But the experience of doing that isn't as good as going to a used bookstore. It isn't anywhere near as nice as going to a good used record store, you know, or, I mean, it just is not an engaging experience, man. And it's like, I would like that, that experience. I mean, I'd like to have something worth owning. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but like, people today are so quick and they want it now that people aren't looking for the experience anymore, they're just looking for the product. Well, you know, but, but it's got to be something that makes the product more exciting. I mean, that's kind of the conundrum, right? It's like, look, you know, what would you rather do, right? Your, your choice is, okay, I mean, my favorite band's got a simulcast concert tonight, right? I can stay home and watch it, or I can go see it at a hall 45 minutes from here, right? I mean, you might up and go pay more. Why? Because it's a different experience, right? And it's not as easy as sitting home and getting it right now. 
So, you know, the thing becomes, how can I make the experience different? You know, so that it's like, oh, that's better than this, you know? And it's like, I don't know what that is. You know, if I did, I'd be back in You know, but, but it's like, it's what's needed. I mean, that is what record companies should be doing instead of trying to figure out how to get 20% of somebody's touring income. Would you not <coughs> say the analogy could be that the <coughs> experience of going into a record store, use Tower as an example, has now been replaced by the experience of going to the Apple store? I don't think so. No? You know, I, I don't think so. I, cha I, I, cha I challenge you to go to the Apple store on a weekend at 2 in the morning. Yeah, yeah you think so? It's, it's a pickup bar. It's, an, it's a social environment. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, and now Apple is doing in-store performances that they're recording with bands and then they're selling it on iTunes. And I think it hasn't replaced it, but I think it's the only thing that people today growing up can find any sort of similarity to what oh, you, okay. the experience you and I had. I mean, look, I, you know, I don't live in Los Angeles. What is, is it Amoeba Records that did great in-stores? Absolutely. You know, I mean, so there were places, you know, I mean, I guess there's models to follow, and that makes sense. You know, I, I just, look, I, I'm not an Apple person. You know, I, I don't understand. have the whole, you know, thing, so it's not my world, I just don't know it. Question? Yes, sir. Do you think vinyl will stick around? Because I buy records. So. Well, you know, I, vinyl is cool, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's the only configuration. It's like a silicon, man. You know, I mean, it's it's like it's a, it's a it's something from a, a world that's extinct. You know, and it might be a cool experience, but I don't see it sticking around as a mass market phenomenon. You know, it's just too out of step. You know, it's it's like saying, boy, I, I love Super Eight movies. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like yeah, they're cool, but you know. But but it is the only configuration that continually has has increased every year in the music yeah, but, industry. It, but minuscule. Right, but I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's a niche. It's free, but it's like, you know, you can't even build a business on those but, but Warner's tried, and they actually have somebody in-house whose job it is is to start releasing stuff on new, new, new titles on vinyl. Well, you know, people do do that stuff. But right. I just, again, you know, right, and, right. And, you know, people have tried it, like Wilco tried it as a hedge against downloading, right? Right, right. Where, hey, buy the vinyl and we'll give you a CD. Or give cr music critics a vinyl, vinyl to, to review, because you can't. Yeah. You yeah. can't. Yeah. I think that records have stayed around for so long because of that experience, and that, that people are still holding on to it, all the involvement in the music. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, it says I want something better. You know, I mean, I just, I just like I said, I think it's like you know an anachronism. You know, and I don't see it like great big, but to me, it does signal that people want something worth owning that they feel good about. You know, and and it's incumbent upon us to figure out what it is. Uh, one thing that I've always believed, because like basically growing up, like I always had, I never um, ever had to buy a CD. I could always get it for free. I always had a huge music library, and it was all stuff for free. But I'm a musician at the same point, so at some point I was like, well, this is silly. I'm getting all my music for free. How am I ever going to get paid? Right. And there came a point only about two years back where this artist um, who I really like, he was posting for about six months about his uh, solo full-length record. He had um, pictures and videos of himself recording it. When that record was coming out, he had like, um, not a Kickstarter, but his own type of thing. And I felt like connected to this artist in, the, in a way that I was like, I don't want to download it. I want, I want like my name to be in the liner notes. I want, I want the CD not just because of what's on it, but because of who I feel that I'm connected to. Right. And when the CD was getting shipped out, he had pictures of himself packing it away. And then I, I realized that the, the, the most amount of physical CDs I have come hand packaged from an artist who I care about. And so I'm not only buying the music that's on there, I'm buying a connection to somebody right. who's, right. I support. Right. So, so in other words, you know, you're related to the, the experience of what the artist makes you essentially part of their world, yeah. right? And, and that that's the thing you want to participate in. So it becomes really like, okay, I could download this, but I'm going to make a conscious choice to support this guy. Why? Because I feel like I'm like emotionally involved with him. Is that essentially what it is? Well, <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, well, look, you know, it is an emotional investment. I mean, when you like somebody's music. And something else that, like, I've, I've heard, like, a lot of, like, really forward-thinking people say is, like, they look at the video game industry mm -hmm. and, like, how have video games evolved from where it used to be four people sitting down and playing a video game in one room to where now they're split up. And one thing that I really like is that people have an urge to be competitive. 
and when, when records were out and stuff, there was a competitive side to it, like, look, I got this rare cut. Look, mm -hmm. I have this, like, mm -hmm. um, thing that was right. released. And I think that as artists, we need to make things, like, where it's a Kickstarter, and your friend's like, oh, I got the CD, and it's signed. You're like, yeah, look in the liner notes. My name is in there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the music experience needs to be social, it needs to be competitive, and needs to be meaningful, both from fan to artist and from fan to fan as well, or else you're not going to sell any product. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I think you're talking about something real. Now, let me ask you, you're an artist, right? Now, you're talking about a world in which you have to be more than a composer and a musician. Yeah. Right? You're signing on for, like, running your own career, essentially. Yeah. Right? Like, hey, man, who's going to update the Facebook page every day? Yeah. You know, who's going to post these pictures of me packing the boxes? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a grind. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's hard before you do this stuff, right? But now it's like, okay, man, you know, you're on the road and you're like sleeping in a van or sleeping on your friend's floors, you know, and you're playing and you're driving 400 miles and after the gig you have to sit for 45 minutes and sign t-shirts, which might be against, mm -hmm. but you also might want to go to sleep, yeah. you know, I mean, not everybody can do this. And you know, when it comes back to my experience from like, you know, writing my first book, which is, hey, where there's great music, there's a great artist, and where there's a great career, there's a great manager. Now you're saying to an artist, no, 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 you can't just be an artist. You know, you gotta be a businessman too, which if you, you know, maybe that is just the reality, okay? But, you know, bear in mind, man, you, you know, you just signed on for a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, at the same time, like when you look at it, then what we're really doing is we're being like, oh no, we have this terrible problem. Only the most passionate, hardworking individuals can make it in music. We're like, what are we going to do if all the non passionate, non hardworking individuals don't make music anymore? We're going to, no, like, all, all yeah. we're really doing in the future is um, coming up with something that's better than the old system. We're coming up with people who aren't, like, just trying to get picked out of a crowd, tapped on the shoulder, supported by a mega label. We're coming out with people who not only care about the music, but care about whose hands. It ends up well, let me, let me put it this way. I mean, that's really admirable, and I, I admire what you're saying. No, I'm serious. I mean, you know, you, you, you're a serious guy, and you're interested in what you want to do, and, you know, I can hear it. You know, I was talking about, you know, you meet artists, some of them, you know, serious, some of them not so serious, but the really good ones are always serious, yeah. right? Even if they're not signing T-shirts at the table. I mean, you, you know, you meet these guys and, you know, you couldn't wake them up at four in the morning and have them not start talking about their work or their career or, you know, their record or this or that, you know, and, and it's like, they care, you know. So it's not like, okay, there's a new breed of artists. It's just that the game has changed. I mean, you're basically saying, hey, man, the bar's being raised. We're going to get rid of some of the pretenders. You know, yeah, you're probably right about that. I mean, you know, you're going into it for like, okay, just because I want to make music, because there's no guarantees, all bets are off, right? I mean, that's really it. And there are models. I mean, it kind of bothers me that, like, you know, the models that get talked about over and over again, you know, Nine Inch Nails or, you know, Radiohead or, you know, this and that. I mean, hey, man, to me, the real the guy, Sufjan Stevens, you know, this is the guy, you know? I mean, if you want to have a model for, like, where it's going, if you take yourself seriously, that's, you know, a guy. But... Or, you know, Vampire Weekend to me, you know, same thing, you know. But it's kind of like, it's not, a, I'm not sure it's a teachable moment with these guys, you know, because they are who they are, you know. And, and that's kind of the thing. It's like, okay, so these guys in Vampire Weekend, they figured something out. They got, you know, they got this song put on this African pop website and it created a little sensation. And they seem to have been plugged into the right people like at Pitchfork. And, you know, it seems like there was a little bit of tampering behind the scenes to make this stuff happen, you know. But once they get there, they know what to do, right? It's really, to me, that's the, the replicable part. You can't do what they did online, right? But once you get your moment, you can do what they did. And what they did was they went and made a deal with an established indie, XL. They got Ian Montone as their manager, who manages Mia and the White Stripes and the Spoons. And they said, wow, this is the guy, you know. And they got a good booking agent. And, you know, they took the pieces of the existing business that could serve them after they, like, just got on the public's radar, mm -hmm. you know. If you take a look at a band like Clap Hands Say Yeah, you remember them? They also were a band that broke off the internet and they never repeated. Why? Because they didn't take that moment and build a structure based on like real support people, you know. They just said, oh, we'll just keep doing it from the internet, right? But, you know, 
I don't know. You know, it's it's really it's a fascinating question, and it's very encouraging to hear you be you know so optimistic and driven because you know there are moments when when I, when I look at it and I say, man, you know, um, I see these bands around that like if they happened ten years ago they'd be huge, you know, and now they're cult bands, you know, and it's like you could say I don't care, you know, but there's a part of me that's like. You know, if stuff's good, everybody should know it. You know, and that's what the record companies could do for you. Yeah. You know, I mean, they could they could make you happen. You know, and 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 that's just not there. You know, I mean, I I was telling Steve, you know, I was with Jimmy Iovine recently, the head of Interscope. You know, and one of the things he was talking about was Lady Gaga, and he said to me, if Lady Gaga came around ten years ago, we've done the numbers, she would have sold twenty million copies of her album. You know, I mean, you know, I don't think she saw two million. Is that her? Uh, so, you know, but it's kind of like, okay, Lady Gaga is as famous as she needs to be. There's no doubt about it. You know, but it's kind of like that infrastructure for making people is disappearing. You know, and, and that's the hard part to replace. You know, you can say I don't care, but you might care later. <laughs> um, we're at the end here. Did do you want to say something, Dr. Marconi? <laughs> well, no, then we are at the end yet, so we want to thank. I, I want to th thank Fred for coming well, in from you. the city. Thank you.